Hello, I'm Norman Grossfeld, producer and co-writer of uh, the Pokemon movies, the uh, adaptation from the Japanese versions. And my name is Michael Hegney, and I was the director of the Pokemon movie and also the co-writer of the English language version. Which is actually quite a challenge for us, more than you might think. We don't just typically just take the Japanese script and just translate it and let it go at that. Actually, what we wind up doing is uh, analyzing the story because the Eastern storytelling style is so different than what we're used to in the West and how we tell a story that it sometimes takes a major rewrite of all the themes of the movie, actually, to have it feel more like a Western, westernized story and something that was more homegrown, which is what we really try to do with Pokemon, not only in the movies, but in the TV series. And as we'll be talking about a little bit later, we also did a little bit of re-editing, but we think it was a key, some key re-edits to clarify the stories and to uh, to make the, uh, the storylines very clear-cut and understandable. But but uh, without losing that kind of magical Pokemon feel to them. Our first scene here starts in uh, uh, in, a, in a big mansion, uh, and uh, we have a father and a daughter here, and it kind of establishes the story, which is, um, a lot of people have said this is their favorite of the three Pokemon movies because the story is kind of unusual, a little bit different. It's not a big, evil Pokemon uh, uh, challenging Ash and his friends and his uh, Pokemon friends, but uh, it's a little more subtle, uh, and it touches on some relationship things that kind of hit home with a lot of our audience, I think. Yeah, it's more human. And I think one of the big story changes right up front that we hinted at already, when they were sitting together on the bed, they were looking through a storybook, and uh, Molly talked to her father about how he's always been looking for the unknown. It's been quite a while they has been looking for it. And he has a moment there where he's like, well, yes, I've been looking for them for quite some time. What we're alluding to there is actually the fact that he's been looking for them ever since his wife disappeared, which is something we've added to the English story. His wife disappeared in our version of the story because while she was researching and looking for the unknown as well. Love you. Pleasant dream. Right. There, there was, uh, as we mentioned before, we did a little re-edit, which we'll talk about later in the movie when it comes up. But uh, it was a little unclear. Here you see a picture of, of the whole family. And also it introduce, introduces uh, the fact that uh, they're familiar with Ash and his mom and Professor Oak. Uh, so right in the first few minutes, um, uh, there are sort of foreshadowings of the story. And we just we just added that, that thing about the, uh, the mom uh, also being a, a Pokemon researcher and sort of archaeologist just to kind of add to the mystery and, and, and the story right up front. Now we here we have uh, the, the professor uh, has gotten word of a major discovery uh, uh, regarding this, this mysterious Pokemon, and he's gone to, to check it out here. There's our first appearance of uh, the unknown. I think the unknown or the first um, computer-generated animated Pokemon that we've had in either the series or any of the movies. That's that right? true. That is true. Actually, all of them have been 2D. The other 3D work that has been done in the movie has always been uh, backgrounds or vehicles or something of that nature or in the environments, but this is the first time a Pokemon has been a, a 3D animated Pokemon. There have been a lot of, of, of computer-generated animation in, in all three of the movies, and I think it's, it's sort of grown exponentially with each... Uh, with each movie, you'll see uh, a lot of uh, computer-generated animation, which impressed a lot of people in this movie. Yeah, I think, you know, <clears throat> not uh, to bash other people, but I think that... <laughs> we'll save that for later. Pokemon movies don't really get enough credit, because... Uh, even from the critics and from an adult point of view, they always focus on the merchandising phenomenon that took place around the world of Pokemon. But take a look at the stories. Take a look, and from our Japanese counterparts, where they where they did the animation, I would put this up against any movie, any Hollywood movie, for the look of it. I think it's so striking. Um, you know, people like to think of it. It's it definitely has the anime style, especially in the mouth movements and the eyes of the characters. But I would take the look. I would put up the look of this against anything in Hollywood, anywhere, anything produced anywhere. And you'll see some some stunning animation coming up. One of the things about uh, a Japanese style movie um, is that there's many openings to it. The, the story starts, and then there's another opening, and there's another opening, and then there's typically in the Pokemon movies there's more than one ending. <laughs> so uh, we're we're still in their opening, kind of the uh, pre-opening of the movie, setting setting up the story. 
You can see that the, the character spelled Mama and Papa and me. Uh, the unknown characters are alphabet, they're just shaped like the alphabet letters. And we had a little challenge when we were naming Molly, the girl in the movie, because actually why that worked in Japanese, you know, English is practically a second language there for them. But they named the girl in the Japanese version of the movie, Me. That was her name. So when she spelled out Mama and Papa and Me, she was spelling her own name. Luckily for us, it worked out. We didn't have to reanimate the scene because she was just talking about herself uh, as me. And that worked for us. So uh, at this point in the movie, Molly's already lost her father. She's already lost her mother. Uh, so she's now all alone. And, uh, you know, you feel very sorry for her. But as the movie progresses, and you'll see, it's possible that she could be a bit of a brat uh, <laughs> causing all these problems. And one of the key things we had to worry about was that we had to make sure that you always felt sorry for Molly and you didn't feel that she was being a bit of a brat or else once you stop caring about her, you stop caring about the movie, um, I think. So uh, that was a bit of a challenge, a little fine line we had to walk. She's really the one who brings about... <laughs> Uh, not so indirectly, uh, all, all the problems for Ash and his friends and all the people uh, uh, in this place. And so, uh, as Norman said, it was kind of it, kind of a thin line. She had to sort of be the antagonist of the whole piece, and, and, but still be sympathetic. Uh, you know, it was it, she, she had these desires as coming up f for uh, in, in this book here. Right here, we added um, I'm like this voiceover. She's remembering her father speaking. This is definitely something we added in the English version. Didn't exist in the Japanese version. And again, things aren't always as clear in the Japanese version of the movie as what's happening in the story. So we go through and re, just really mostly through the writing, clarify the story. Uh, and I think we mentioned before, they don't always necessarily ask the question like, why does something happen? In a, in a Japanese movie, the audience is, is it's just a different style. It's just culturally different. They don't really ask very often, like, why is that? Why is that happening? There's the story unfolds, what happens, happens. And where we need logic in the West, I don't think they necessarily need it there. Um, when we talk to our Japanese counterparts about movie number two, Pokemon 2000, we asked them a couple of questions, but we were very puzzled with some things that happened in the movie that we solved the problems in our own script. We asked them, well, what were you guys thinking there? And they said, oh, you're right. That does not make very much sense. But we like it when the audience sometimes leaves the movie theater puzzled. Yeah. And, and, and just a different way of uh, telling a story. Yeah, we felt more strongly that it's just, as Norma says, just just a different way of looking at things. We kind of felt, well, gee, why does that happen? And why would she do this? And why would she make this kind of leap of, of, of thinking that Entei uh, is her father? And so we did things like we had the, the same uh, actor who, who did the voice for the father also do the voice for Entei. And as Norman pointed out, we had that little uh, voiceover, sort of uh, an internal monologue for Molly recalling her father's words of reading this story uh, as sort of Entei. So we we hope that clarified it for, for English-speaking audiences. Step by step, Ash, Misty, and Brock continue their Pokemon journey, wondering what adventures await them as they travel into unknown territory, never suspecting that's exactly where this road leads. Are any of you guys Pokemon trainers? Yeah, I'm Ash Ketchum from Pallet, and I want to be a Pokemon master. I'm Brock from Pewter City, and I want to be your boyfriend. Thanks, but no thanks. I'm a trainer too, want to battle. <laughs> Go ahead, Ash. All right. A workout will help me stay And here we are going into our third, and we promise our final <laughs> opening of the movie. And this is where we do the main title sequence. This is always an opportunity for us to feature Pokemon and battles, and typically in... Every Pokemon movie, Ash has a big battle where we get to debut some all-new Pokemon that have never been seen, seen before on the big screen, and that's an opportunity right here with some of these Pokemon. Some of these are Pokemon. Totodile is, is in uh, season three of the U.S. show. 
Um, but you'll see a lot of Pokemon in here that are not in season Especially three. Especially Lisa, who's the girl that they're battling. Lisa's Pokemon are all new to the series, or to Pokemon and far, as far as an animation. That's Giraffe Rig, I think. So you're gonna be able to name all these, right? Uh, <laughs> I, well, uh, m many of them. Let's see, there's, there's Chikorita. I was fine uh, through 151. When we added the extra 100 Pokemon, we're now up to about 251 of them. There are some that I'll actually have to look on the chart for now. I didn't have to do that for the first 151, but uh, I'd say really, I probably have about 225 of them committed to memory. And because of that, actually, I'm going to be committed very soon. <laughs> They're working the tails in the uh, in the new ones there. The a palm there has a, a hand on his tail, and Giraffe Rig has a face and a head, which is disturbing, but useful. Some of the things you might see that we always do um, our openings of the movies, this is the third one now, feature a remixed version of our TV show theme, kind of a fully blown out version of the song uh, in an all new style and that usually winds up on our soundtrack albums. I think that might be the one thing that that Ash has. Uh, it's Hoot Hoot, I think, or or Knocked Owl, actually. Right, it's Knocked Owl. Knocked Owl. Uh, I think in the series, uh, if you went to see the movie um, while the series uh, when it first came out, um, that might be a little confusing because uh, he hasn't gotten the Knocked Owl yet. He hasn't got. Yeah, or he has the Hoot Hoot and hasn't evolved into a Knocked Owl, I believe. Uh, so, uh, but I'm sure that savvy Pokemon fans will have figured that out. By the time the home video comes out, it should all be resolved for them, story-wise. So I think one of the, you know, all the time we're asked why do we think Pokemon's become such a big phenomenon. And I think the key thing, if you ask a kid if they were able to uh, vocalize why uh, they feel so strongly about it, is that they really wish that Pokemon were real. And the kids watching this opening sequence, really wish they were able to do this. They wish they could have Pokemon for real, that they could get involved in these battles where nobody ever gets hurt. It's fun, there's lots of powers, and you get to nurture these wonderful creatures. And I think that's the number one reason that you probably won't hear from a kid, but if a kid would think about it, they want this to be real. That would be their number one wish. And actually, we've gotten a couple of letters and emails from kids that have said, uh, you know, I wish this was real. I wish this was really happening for me. Um, and Nintendo is working on that, <laughs> but it's going to take a little while. So just be patient. And uh, I think the the other thing about the series and, and about the movies too is, um, uh, you know, there's there's limited participation by adults. I mean, the kids are really the masters of uh, sort of the, not only the Pokemon but their own lives. They travel around and uh, they have all sorts of adventures, and they're generally not scolded for for doing a lot of. And they seem to also have unlimited limited resources. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they just are always seeming to come up with a unlimited supplies of food yeah. without really any at least that I can see any form of income. No 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 visible means of support. But they they live on the edge once in a while, but they never actually fall over it. Um, they always have plenty of Pokémon Chow Brock takes care of that. Anywhere around here? There's one just over the mountains in Greenfield. Just over the mountains. He, you know, he has to get in good with the girls. He loves the girls, of course. I think it's interesting. Keep, keep your eye on Brock. Uh, the actor that portrays Brock also does the voice for James. And I think there couldn't be two more different characters in an animated series. Um, something else to keep track of is that the ca actress who plays Misty also does the voice for Jesse on both the TV series and the movie. Uh, and Brock, as I say, couldn't be more different than James here. Brock, of course, is uh, infatuated with practically every girl he can think of or imagine or meet. Um, and I think it's just about the opposite for James. Uh, I think the one possible love interest, female love interest that James might have had in the TV series for you viewers was one episode where his parents wanted him to marry and he was practically begging, kicking and screaming, doing anything he could to not get married. Of course, he didn't get married in that episode. Here they are now, Team Rocket. Fields of flowers that turn into a bizarre crystal wasteland that obliterates the entire... Hey, what's going on? I thought Greenfield was supposed to be pretty. It looks horrendous. Not only that, it looks bad. 
Well, there's me out there. Our, I was about to say our only talking Pokemon, but that's not technically true. Um, we had uh, slow. Slow. Slow King did talk in movie number two, and also psychic Pokemon have talked in all the movies. So uh, in the first movie, Mewtwo was able to speak psychically. Psychically, but doesn't actually speak directly. And we love that, by the way. <laughs> when a Pokemon, or virtually anybody in anything we're adapting from a Japanese movie speaks psychically, that that's a good news to us, because that means we don't have to match their lips moving. We can put any words in their mouth or in their minds that we like. And that's one of the biggest challenges for us, is that we might have a concept for something we're writing that may take a few lines, but the Japanese got through it by saying, "Yep," or one, you know, one mouth movement, one lip, one lip flap, um, and so we have to figure out how we're going to write the movie or rewrite the movie with our concepts, but using the existing animation, the existing mouth movement. So it's definitely great for us when we have a psychic Pokemon. Entei in this movie, for example, it was great that Entei was psychic. So uh, any thought he had, we could, I mean, we could put any thoughts in his mind that we wanted. Another thing, you know, talking about Pokemon speaking, Michael. Uh, oh, actually, before we do that, the sharp-eyed Pokemon fans will see that oh, yes, here comes. we missed a little mistake that we made. Um, that up on the screen here, on Professor Oak's screen, you'll see the word "unknown" spelled actually correctly. Uh, here, look here. closely there. So they, and so know. they're talking about the unknown Pokemon. Normally, what we do in all the movies and in all the uh, TV shows is we go back in and we look for stuff that's not consistent, or if there's actually any Japanese writing, and we go in and rotoscope it out or reanimate the scene. And that one, it was spelled correctly. We kind of just missed it. It should have been spelled incorrectly, the word unknown, U-N-O-W-N. -N. Well, I was talking about um, Michael. Many, I don't know, many viewers probably don't know this. Michael actually performs many of the voices of the Pokemon. Uh, Pokemon only speak their own name. Uh, they only say their own name, typically, or they make a sound. They don't speak uh, dialogue. Uh, so Michael portrays many of the voices, many of the Pokemon. I think his classic is Psyduck. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, Michael, how you felt when you saw that Psyduck had actually no no role in this movie whatsoever. Well, not only was I upset, Psyduck was really uh, Well, I got a call devastated. from his agent. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what that was all about. I just had my assistant deal with it. The Psyduck and, and Charm of course Charmander has evolved into uh, someone who is a big favorite uh, and uh, we don't want to give anything away but we uh, may be hearing from that individual a little bit later on as well. We, I'm always interested in, in Ash's relationship with his mom because she's really a pretty freewheeling mom. Ash just goes, tours the countryside, rarely comes home, and she seems pretty unaffected by it. So, well, it's because Ash's father did the same thing. He's following the footsteps of, of his own dad. And that's a big mystery to us. And uh, we're thinking, you know, we had some conversation. What, who is Ash's dad? Where is he? And <clears throat> we. Uh, we're told by our Japanese counterparts that we're going to find out more about Ash's dad in season five of Pokemon. Right now, uh, uh, in the year 2001, in September, uh, we'll be beginning broadcasting uh, season four of Pokemon. So we're actually a year behind. Uh, but in season five, we were promised that we would learn more about Ash's dad. He's never in any photos. We never hear about him, really, other than in episode one of the TV series. She says, just like your father, you're going to go on your Pokemon journey. Um, you know, some people that follow Pokemon a lot know that we produced a live musical version of Pokemon, like kind of a Broadway style show called Pokemon Live. And when we were, it's the first thing that was allowed to be produced outside of Japan originally that we produced. And uh, one of the concepts for the show is that when, when we wrote the original pass at it, we had Giovanni as the big revelation in the show is Giovanni from Team Rocket, the evil leader of Team Rocket that you'll see in the first movie, as Ash's dad. And uh, I have come for you. this is Michael's favorite line in the movie here. <laughs> you are. Mama. Mama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we you were. be there, really. <laughs> Child. Hey! We've already met Brock's father. 
way back in 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 season one, and Brock had his his father had gone on a Pokemon journey, I think, but he was a failure, and he was a failure, and Brock was taking care of all his like twelve brothers and sisters, and uh, so Brock jumped at the chance to to uh, to uh, give up that responsibility, but he he's retained that kind of home body. He's always cooking and and cleaning and and uh, making sure that everyone's well fed, both human and Pokemon. So it was good practice for him. Misty's parents, we haven't found out anything. Or sisters. She has three sisters back sisters in Cerulean, in Cerulean City. City. Yes. <clears throat> so here Molly has asked Entei to bring her a mother. So now she thinks Entei's her father. She sees the mother. Ash is Ash with his mom on TV. She wants a mom, too. Entei makes it so. And Entei repeats the line that we'll hear throughout the movie, if that is what you wish. Um, and whatever she wishes, Entei brings her, as you'll see. Which is good for her in a way, but it causes a lot of problems. And I'm Molly, remember? The actress who portrays, uh, Amy Birnbaum is the actress who portrays Molly, and she had a bit of a challenge in this movie for herself because you'll see in a little bit that Molly actually goes through three different age ranges. There's a kind of a teenage Molly, and then uh, I guess a 12-year-old. I guess right here she's about five, I would say. Five or six, I think. Uh, yeah. And uh, then she becomes a teenager, an older teenager, maybe like 18, and then she becomes a 12-year-old. Like sort of around in, in Misty's Ash, age, Ash yeah. or Misty age. Here, the, we're, we're this is the same sound of the Pokemon in Japanese. The unknown are making the sound, which we interpret as unknown. They're kind of a sing-songy, unknown, like all the other Pokemon speaking a variation of their name only. Yes, it does get very complicated. We have to have a database of. Uh, Pokemon and their sounds and what they sound like. And sometimes we'll have a Pokemon in, so, in season one we haven't seen in, for us, we haven't seen it in three years. Then it'll show up in an episode in maybe season four in the movie, and we have to go back into our database to find out just exactly what did this Pokemon sound like. Because if we make a mistake, you know, we might not catch it, but the kids will definitely know. And that's the most important thing is that we have to be true to the world of Pokemon every step of the way. Right. We generally uh, we we tend we keep the Japanese voices if it is the same name in Japanese and English, or and if the Pokemon only makes a sound. Uh, there are some that that just that, that don't say their names. They make kind of a sound. Otherwise, we we change all the Pokemon voices. And uh, as Norman says, that can be uh, uh, confusing. So that's why we we keep a, a reference of everything and check back whenever we do them. Here we are in the Charizard, Charorific, I think Charorific Valley. TV show viewers know that Ash's Charizard stayed behind in one of the episodes to live with all the Charizards. We like this scene here where the Charizard is just sitting at home with a bow on her head. Uh, there's Ash's Charizard outside the window, uh, seeing his former master uh, having a bit of a dilemma. The Charizard is, is training with uh, that poke. He decided to, to be the best Char Charizard he can be. Uh, and that's why he's, he stayed behind. I think he has a, a, a Nike uh, endorsement <laughs> coming up. For the U.S. Marines or something. Or something like that. Or the U.S. Army. Actually, the largest speaking role in the movie uh, if you add up all the lines, I think was the TV reporter. <laughs> right, she had uh, more lines than anybody <laughs> in this movie. So whenever Molly gets upset, the unknown are f what, what may or may not be clear to the viewers is that the unknown are feeding off of Molly's own emotions and her feelings and her fantasies, and and everything that's in her mind is what's feeding the energy of the unknowns. And when she gets upset here that somebody's trying to break into her home into the tower, uh, the unknown makes short work of it. Get rid of the uh, guy in the tractor. But there's no other explanation. The bulldozer. First, Professor Hale disappears. The appearance of Officer Jenny there, another TV series favorite. It must be behind it. <laughs> Email. Mama and Papa and me just want to stay by ourselves forever, so stay away. Everybody, leave us alone. Some references to Mama. Everybody kind of knows in the movie that there's no mother. Uh, in the Japanese version of the movie, we talked about this a little bit before, you'll see at the end of the movie um, the big surprise that's in the credits, but 
that was a puzzling thing to us. I was like, well, what happened to the mother exactly? And then we learned, we, we made up our own story what happened to the mother, uh, that she disappeared. And that's why the father was on this quest to find out anything he could about the unknown, because she was searching for the unknown when she disappeared. That had nothing to do with the Japanese story whatsoever. <laughs> The Japanese story, which didn't actually make their own movie, it was just a story they told each other. Uh, I guess it was a backstory that they eventually got edited out of the script. Was that the mother was upset with the father being such a workaholic, so I think she was institutionalized, and she was away somewhere. I'm going to in their backstory, and that's why she wasn't around, which is very unfulfilling for us as a story because if Molly, to us, we thought, well, if Molly knew that her mother. Was away and ill. Why would she be wishing for another mother? Uh, so those are just an example of where you know, in the Eastern storytelling style, perhaps they're like, oh, well, that's that's the mother's there. She's not there. It's just that's just the stories unfolding for them. But for us, we kind of had to we had to know for ourselves what was going on, just so the movie made more sense to us. I'm not saying it doesn't make sense to a Japanese audience, or it, it still makes sense. It's just not as logical. We should be able to get to the mansion if we follow this stream. Walking through a stream coming from that wacky building. There must be some valuable Pokemon inside. And the only way to get there must be by waiting. That's right. But they're walking through the water. They're waiting. No, they're walking. They're waiting. How could they be waiting? We really use Team Rocket, especially in this movie. There's really not a lot of humor in this movie. I blame Michael completely. <laughs> Actually, Team Rocket, I think it seems, uh, we didn't put a stopwatch on this, but it seems like uh, they have less screen time in this movie than in either of the other two. And uh, we even have them make sort of an allusion to that a little bit later on that they're. We really used them for comic relief because uh, they could have been removed from the story, I think, and the story itself would have been unaffected. Although the best, and Michael really writes all the, all the jokes for Team Rocket. Uh, he did a great job injecting some extra humor into the movie. Think we could shimmy up to the tower? Hmm? It might take us out. You know, it was definitely a challenge to try to find a way to lighten up this film as far as the, the, the weightiness of the story without some humor. So whenever we had an opportunity to, to put some comedy in, we definitely looked at every opportunity with Team Rocket. Uh, there wasn't much time to set the jokes up they, there is because everything is so short, so uh, uh, we hope we, we push the, pack the laughs in there. Yeah, the thing, and that's where we talk about the challenge of us having to adapt the movie from the Japanese. We were going to write a, a comedy scene. We just it would be written, and then it would be animated, and then hopefully it would be funny. But for us, we're kind of stuck with the animation we have, and then we're trying to work backwards and try to make something funny out of it. The other thing is, because we get what are called literal translations, and not that there is any such thing, um, we, we lose puns and plays on words and jokes that are allusions to other uh, Eastern things. And so sometimes we'll look at a scene, and it seems like it should be funny, but it doesn't seem funny, and we know that we're missing something in the translation. So uh, that's an additional challenge. And another challenge also is that because it might be a pun or something else that only makes sense in the Japanese culture, you might, you might, we might come across characters making this huge reaction <laughs> in a scene, like, oh, you know, they have a huge facial reaction, they're laughing or whatever, that we then have to figure out, oh, well, they have this huge reaction. We have to go back sometimes two minutes to set up something that they'll ultimately be reacting to that wasn't in the Japanese at all, just to justify the animation that we get. Now, Ash's mom is in a trance here. Uh, Entei's put her in this trance, and she believes she's Molly's mother. But nothing could keep a real mother in a trance when they see that their own child, and there her eyes reveal that she's out of her trance now. When her own child is in danger, she snaps out of it, but doesn't reveal to Molly or Entei that she's back to normal. She's got her full <laughs> faculties again. <gasps> a Bulbasaur and a Chikorita! I think that boy must be a Pokemon trainer, don't you, Mama? Uh, yes. I bet he has lots of other Pokémon with him, too. Right, Papa? Uh, Papa? Thanks for a great job, Not Now, we had some physicists uh, at the Jet Propulsion Lab check out whether this is truly possible for somebody to climb up using their Pokémon that way, and probably that's a bit of a stretch. Uh, we think that the Pokémon would have been pulled down the waterfall by the weight <laughs> of Ash we, ourselves, but it works for the movie. Now, they have some sort of suction thing at the bottom of their feet that keeps them at the top of the waterfall. That's one of the questions. So, the other question that, that Norman and I constantly debate is whether there are animals in the Pokémon world. 
Right, because they'll they'll go, you know. The you know the concept is that the animals of the Pokemon world are the Pokemon, but then and that's all that they ever talk about. That's all you ever hear. But then if they wake up in the morning, you will hear a rooster, or they might have fried chicken. Oh, the so where exactly does the fried chicken come from? Yeah. So th there may be an alternative universe that no one is really talking about that's populated with uh, food-producing <laughs> creatures, that, but um, uh, they're not. They're only alluded to infrequently. To read the thoughts of other life forms. The other thing that they, the Japanese don't really, they don't go this touched on this subject is what exactly are they eating? Yeah, I mean they're they're eating and they're eating. Sometimes they're eating meat products. Is you know the question is then are they eating a Pokemon? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I don't want to get that mental picture. Now here you'll see that there's only one Pokemon out, Cyndaquil. But in this edit here, I think we think they edited this. All of a sudden, there are three Pokemon out, or four Pokemon out. There's Water Pokemon and Fire Pokemon. Um, you know, sharp-eyed viewers might think, and we think actually, that uh, the Japanese version of the movie they must have edited something there. Uh, we sort of took it. Well, it might be a sort of a time lapse that wasn't really too strongly visually indicated. But that's a good example of, of something that 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 to a Western viewer, you know, who's used to picking out gaffes or mistakes or, or perceived mistakes mistakes, might say, wait a minute, there, there was only Cyndaquil, and now there are three, which doesn't seem to be a value uh, in the East. It's not. It's more the, the totality of the story and the kind of magical atmosphere that's happening. So it's not really a mistake for them. It's just something that is not, it, it is not seen as, as crucially important, where, where we, we kind of think it is important. Maybe the unknown are creating a new reality, just like Professor Oak said. That's it. Whatever it is, we can't uh. stop now. Now, you'll notice all the environments that they now encounter are actually scenes from the storybook that Molly used to read with her father. So this is a page from the storybook um, she's recreating. So the unknown are tapping into her fantasies and her dreams to create these alternate realities. Oh, no. What now? I was kind of hoping that Team Rocket would actually capture the unknown and bring him back to the boss and get the bonus and the vacation and the congratulations that they always seem to miss. Come on. I haven't seen this many strange letters since the last time I placed a personal ad. You know, it's funny that line. We all laugh at that line whenever we hear it. Uh, but um, <laughs> you know, when we watched the movie with, uh, actually, we did a premiere of the movie in Los Angeles area, uh, a school that had participated in our Read a Rama. We had we encouraged kids to read around the country, and whichever school read the most books during a certain month got to get the world premiere of the movie at their school. So out there watching the movie with an, a theater filled with just kids, and they were all just elementary school kids, all the jokes that we were laughing at, then we, we inject some jokes in just so that the wor movie works on many levels for different age groups. A lot of those things, like the classified ads, just went completely over their head. <laughs> but we have to give the, the adults something to... Uh, to uh Appreciate because the, the Pokemon world can be a little confusing for so, the uninitiated. So uh, every once in a while, we sprinkle in something that that um, the adults can appreciate who aren't Pokemon watchers. Here's the, Molly's first transformation to the teenage Molly. So obviously, all we're seeing here, everything's a fantasy of the sleeping Molly, who the real Molly's still upstairs, uh, fallen asleep on Ash's mother's lap. And Ash's mother's name is Delia, actually. And in, in uh, Japanese, uh, Delia, they don't have names for, for the adults, actually. She's just Ash's mother. And when Professor Oak, for example, would refer to Ash's mother, he would say, Ash's mama-san without actually having to say her name. Uh, so we're that's a uniquely Western uh, invention of the names for the adults, actually. 
Professor Oak. I think we named him Samuel because we had to us in a, maybe it was the TV show and the movies when they were asking Professor if somebody was speaking to Professor Oak, we imagined that hey, you know, you might actually if you were an adult, you'd say his first name, especially if you knew him very well. Uh, so we added that in the Japanese uh, culture. They just it was always Professor Oak or Oak-san. Yeah. Why waste your time battling him when you can battle me? All right. No way. What's different about this Pokemon movie is that. This is the first time, I think, other than in the opening title sequence, that actual Pokemon battles figure into the story, as they as you actually would battle if you were a Pokemon trainer for real, which is, Pokemon battles are typically real competitions that take place with rules, and here they're establishing the rules now. How many Pokemon you'll use, they'll take place on a field or a playing field of some sort, where you will use your Pokemon one-on-one uh, -on -one against another Pokemon until the other Pokemon is defeated. And defeated doesn't mean gets killed, because nobody ever dies in Pokemon. No Pokemon ever dies from battle. They just faint. They just pass out and live to battle another day. So here, the Pokemon battles actually are part of the story. There was that that famous Pokemon battle at the end of of uh, well, it was sort of a battle. You're right. But it was more of a story in, in, in movie one near yeah, the it was, end. It was yeah. a story battle. It wasn't uh, just a a competition. That was to the death. Exactly. Another new Pokemon, I believe. Yes. It's working, Zubat. Okay, now. I think it's Flaffy, isn't it? Uh, Flaffy, yes. It's sort of the bah, the sheep and fluffy and so Flaffy. The the new names of the uh, uh, of the uh, gold and silver Pokemon uh, come come from Nintendo, right? Zubat, return. So something may, many people may not know is that the Pokemon names are originally in Japanese. We rename them with Nintendo of America here in the states. Uh, for English, the English names actually are used everywhere else in the world, except for France and Germany, uh, where they have unique names in French and unique names in German. Just to complicate our lives even more, but in Canada, where they speak French, they use the English names. So we have a lot to keep track of. I think you're a cute Pokemon trainer and have a cute Pokemon. Teddy Ursa is a lot more than just cute. Teddy Ursa, dynamic punch. Use your quick attack! Use your fury swipes, Teddy Ursa! Trying to remember, I think Vulpix was a was a gift to Brock, wasn't it? Uh, Vulpix left the um that breeder, yes, a that's breeder right. That he fell in love with. He fell, right. fell in love with every girl he meets. Yeah, that's nothing new for him. But um, he, he didn't. He didn't win. Uh, he didn't capture Vulpix in the in the traditional way. Ridiculous, James. This is actually one of my favorite lines in the movie is when James is running up the steps and says, "This looks like a storybook land invented by a five-year-old." Getting it exactly right, <laughs> and then Jesse says, uh, "That's ridiculous. Let me do the thinking around here." <laughs> but nobody really ever seems to react to that line. <laughs> I better start to really rock and roll. And my onyx is just how I like to rock and roll. Rock and roll, huh? That's For those of you who don't know, actually, somehow, miraculously, the Pokemon become energy and live inside these Pokeballs that they're carrying until they're released. Then they take their true form. This battle, to me, doesn't obviously is part of her fantasy world, but I don't see of Fanpy actually defeating an Onyx like this. I'm not quite sure how Onyx's body is attached. Each of the boulders. <laughs> Maybe movie four will will explain that. All right then. The, uh, here's the, here's the, uh, we'll get back to that in a second. Here's the storybook, so you'll see all the different scenes. Uh, and you'll see some of these scenes actually later in the movie from the storybook, all coming from Molly's mind. Um, and all the different pages come to life. This is where it kind of falls into place for Ash's mom. If you ever looked at one of our scripts, as I was saying, you'll notice that, um, 
we spend a lot of time on what we call a react, which is the sounds that the people make when they're not actually speaking. And if you look at some other adaptations, I think from other producers, they probably would not pay that much attention to the reacts. Uh, in our script, you'll see there's tons of reacts, and actually Michael's a master at naming what type of react. It should be like a sighing, grunt, disgruntled react, and of course the actors know exactly what that means, and it's right in the script. So it doesn't just say. Yeah, I'm the reacting. only one. <laughs> he has these incredible names for what they're exactly saying, and and also, uh, you know, I noticed especially when we first started doing this um, in season one of the TV series, there were a lot of reacts like uh, um, sort of a where we would say yes or uh huh. The Japanese do sort of a closed. Mm. And I was luckily I was used to this because I used to watch in New York. They had a channel that had the Japanese soap operas on, and I always found them fascinating. Uh, and and the uh, they would do the, the human car uh, human uh, actors would do this too. So I was kind of used to that. Uh, but it is a little bit different than the kind of thing that we would see uh, in uh, regular animated cartoons. And there are a lot of uh, sort of non-Western ways of doing things that uh, we try to adapt. And some more successfully than others. It's curious that you talk about the um, the curious react I just had. The, the react that you're talking about, because when dealing with Japanese people that I've dealt with on the business side of the thing of the movies uh, or the TV show, they'll do that same thing in real life. They'll be like the closed mouth. Mm. Agree, react, but it's actually it's an agree, react, but it's a closed but, agree, react. What you take away from the conversation is, well, did they just agree with what I'm saying? And it, the fact is that when you hear that kind of a thing, they're just acknowledging that yes, you did exactly say that, right? But not, not necessarily are, are it's they not agreeing like, yes, with you? Yes, they're not actually answering yes. So, um, okay, that's another thing in addition to the flap and the <laughs> script that we always watch for. My favorite Pokemon in this movie is coming up right now in one of the Pokemon battles. It's Mantine. And Mantine, uh, did we keep the Japanese? Did we keep the Japanese voice? It's a fishy chewing gum that freshens your breath, too, I think. Did we keep the original Japanese? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> no, he, no, he does the opera. <laughs> what is it? It's like he has his opera voice. <laughs> we did keep it. We kept that, it. See, oh, I love a, that. There's an example that it doesn't say its name, uh, but it makes a sound, so we would, we would keep that. So you'll see Mantine coming up in a minute, and he just says, Bruh! type of thing. We got a lot of mileage out of that when we were doing the uh, ADR, the audio digital recording of the movie. Uh, we would impersonate Mantine. There were some long days there. <laughs> How can we breathe underwater? Go with the flow. Sometimes it's better not to ask questions. Hey, Jesse, I got a question that's better I shouldn't ask. Do you think we're going to get a bigger part in the next movie? As Michael was referring to that earlier, you know, uh, we do this every once in a while where we, usually just Team Rocket alone is aware, they have a, an awareness of the fact that this is just all entertainment and that they're in the movie, they're in the TV series. Um, we did something similar at the very end of movie two, Pokemon 2000, um, The Power of One, where Team Rocket's there with Slow King and they all kind of make reference to the fact that they're being watched either on TV or in the movies. And actually, my son hated that. Yeah, Eric didn't like that. Old. He hated that because it broke the wall and and, you know, he said that Pokemon's supposed to be a real thing. What are they doing? That ruins everything. <laughs> the real reason why we did it was we couldn't really think of anything else. Right. Well, that was that. <laughs> that was, was also the rationale. That. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is. I, you know, I'm not even complaining or anything, but it, you know, you, it, especially when you have something that's very short, uh, it's difficult to set up gags, and so sometimes one has to resort to things that uh, the, you wouldn't strictly want to 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 do in in other circumstances. So. Um, we hope we didn't offend anybody by doing that. We just lost all those fans, though. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do? Whenever Ash and his mom meet, it always puzzles us, because you would think the reaction would be something different. Ash's mom's been kidnapped. He's about to find her. I'm sure there's a big hug in store. Let's see. Oh, 
I, I don't... But I'm not going to get within three feet of you, Mom. Yeah, and I think he, in the original, it was even more casual. It's like he's been gone for, he's gone for months. There's lives have been threatened, and the civilization of the Pokemon world is, has been shaken. It's just, hi, oh, hi, hi, honey. How you doing? So, yeah, Ash's relationship with his mom, we changed considerably. In the end of Pokemon movie, the movie 2000, we added this whole scene. Uh, the script's completely different, uh, where Ash's mother is basically scolding him at the end of the movie, in the second movie, we added it that she's so worried about him, misses him, and that's why she's scolding him. And and she, doesn't Ash realize that she he's her whole life, and if he, she loses him, she loses everything. Yeah, she was angry because he was saving the world, and when that just kind of struck us as well, maybe there's a, another side to that. Um, so we we changed it a little bit. Again, it was just a different sensibility. This is the key conversation of the movie where Molly is made aware of the fact that she's not that Ash's mom is not her mother, and in fact, Ente, Ente's not her father. You remember when we played together, Molly? We were at Professor Oak's house in Pallet Town. We'll talk about it later, but we have to go. But why? We have to leave now, Molly. Uh. You see the unknown now about to really feed off of her energy. Uh, I won't. So they, they've acted to protect her uh, and, and, and to keep, keep her from, from having to, to be uh, being taken away from this area. She's very upset, so obviously they're uh, an, an unknown react intensely. And create another page from the storybook, actually, uh, that Ash's mom spots here in the storybook. So it's all from her mind. I think from this point forward in the movie, uh, if you look at some of the direction the art direction and the direction and the camera angles of the animation. This is what I was talking about earlier. I mean, these battle scenes that are coming up now and just the use of the, the CGI mixed with the 2D animation, it's really stunning. It really looks great, uh, especially on the big screen. I mean, the Japanese team does a, a fantastic job, and Norman probably know better. I mean, how long does it take them to, to animate? Actually, I do know this exactly. Um, they finish the story, but they do a movie a year. And they finished the storyboard for this film uh, in about November. Uh, so this, this came out in Japan in July of 2000. So they actually started this, believe it or not, working on this movie in December of 1999. And it was on the screens in Japan in July of 2000. So under nine months. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's uh, unbelievable when you th consider, you know. You know, how Story long, how design. Long well, how long it's taken? It takes uh, here in Hollywood to get a movie made, uh, an animated feature, that would look this good. One thing about the movie that we do in the States also is uh, they use music very sparsely in Japan. So the score, which is done by Ralph Shuck, who did a great job, did Excellent all three job. movies, uh, is completely original for our version of the movie. Uh, kind of give it that bigger animated movie, big score feel. Uh, the Japanese score is just, just there's many areas of the movie that just have absolutely no music. And I guess more, more of our style is it's almost wall-to-wall -wall music for us. As I say that, there's no music right here. <laughs> well, this is a good time to, to, to comment on, on the actors who, who've done a fantastic job and who always do a great job on the TV series. Um, uh, That's true. We've had some great success with uh, the Pokemon movie series without a celebrity actor in any role. And it was one of our, we talked about it at the very beginning, Michael and I, when we did the first movie, well, do we want to incorporate uh, celebrities or big name actors into some of the roles, at least the guest roles, but we felt that the story and the world of Pokemon was more important than the celebrity that we would attach to it. And actually, that might take away from us telling the story or that the, of the story of the world of Pokemon. It might become more about that celebrity. Right. And, and, and Pokemon is kind of its own world. And to, and to bring something of, uh, of another different world into that might, might actually uh, detract from its charm. So we decided not to do that. And, and that uh, was a great decision because it actually saved us a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which had nothing to do with that decision whatsoever. <laughs> No, but uh, but luckily we have actors with really great, strong, strong actors with great voices that that really convey. And and of course, you know, w w with the relatively limited animation that uh, is the anime style, the voice becomes even 
that much more uh, important. The voices become that much more important, and uh, they consistently do a, a, a wonderful job. Pikachu is the original, is the is the Japanese actress, so that's uh, and that's worldwide, I believe. Yeah, Pikachu's voice is the world of, is the voice of Pikachu around the world. And there he is, our old friend. I can't believe it. Neither could we when we saw Charizard appear. <laughs> Now, some of these battle scenes coming up between Charizard and Entei are, are really amazing. The highlights, I think, of the movie, as far as the look of the movie. Thank goodness. Are you all right, Molly? <gasps> what is this? My friend, Charizard. Your friend? Pika! My Pokemon are my friends. We all work together like a family. That's another another big thing of not only the the, the series but of the movies that um, that that team spirit and working together is. Um, I think a very Japanese, very Eastern theme that is very, very strong <clears throat> throughout the series. And as you can see here, even uh, their enemies uh, work together for a common good goal. Um, not that it's missing from, from uh, Western uh, cartoons and other shows, but it's very, very strong. It permeates the whole series. Bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> Here, Team Rocket makes reference again to the fact that they're in show business. <laughs> if anything ever happened to you, we'd be out of show business. And probably after using that joke twice, we're going to be out of show business as, <laughs> as well. I think our alternate was we'd have to get a real job or something. Right. If you come with us, you can have real Pokemon. I already have real Pokemon. Now go away! You're a real Pokemon or not, you can't take the place of her real father! I am Molly's real father, as long as that is her wish. And in this section, sort of Molly starts struggling with what uh, her inner desires are and what is a what's the right thing to do. So um, it's a, 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 a sort of a choice that that character has to make, which is kind of interesting. Um, when I first saw the movie, uh, I was concerned that there wasn't a real big evil villain. Um, and at first I thought, well, maybe that's a weakness of the movie. But I think after seeing it so many times and dealing with it, it's a little more subtle. <laughs> I mean, obviously with giant battle scenes like this, it's not too subtle, but uh, it kind of uh, is much more subtle than just having a big bad Pokemon attack Ash and then them have a battle and Ash win. Yeah, it's much deeper, and I think that, uh, you know, do the youngest of the kids that might be fans of this appreciate that? I'm not quite sure, but it, it makes it enjoyable for a much older audience, too, that we're dealing with shades of issues instead of just black and white. Charizard used to be uh, Ash's uh, most difficult Pokemon. Charizard had a real mind of his own. He uh, would re would frequently disobey commands. He was so fall asleep, lazy. He was uh, uh, sort of surly, and uh, I guess that training camp is really well. Their relationship really developed over time. If you really care about Molly. You let her come with us. See, things I think are very black and white for Entei here. 
Molly wishes for him to be her father, and that's what he's going to do and protect that as much as he could. If that would ever change, if her desires would ever change, he would just go with the new desire. I don't think... So he's definitely not a bad character, and that's the thing about Entei's musical theme, even, is that we want it to be heroic, in fact, instead of the evil, kind of an ominous evil tone to it. Uh, so he has kind of a heroic, heroic uh, melody. Spikes came very much in handy. Here's a point in the movie where the message is a little bit different from what the Japanese had to say, what we had to say, was what Brock and Mister about to say to Molly. It was, com it was completely different uh, in the Japanese version. <laughs> hmm. You're a great Pokemon trainer, Molly. Huh? A big part of battling is knowing when to stop. You already have the right instincts. I bet you could be a gym leader easy, if you wanted to. You see, Molly? We always battle hard, but we always stay friends. Because we all love Pokemon. Wow. Pika Pika! <gasps> Come with us, Molly. On the outside, the battles might be hard. But the friends are real. What do you say? It's just what your papa would want. Here's a, just a, I know, remember this line exactly. Molly says to Ash's mom, your hand's so soft right now in the Japanese version. I just want to see what we did with it. It's a little different. This was a tough flap, as I remember. Lots of flap. real again. Which to us made more sense as the line that would go there and things start returning to normal in the world. But to get there, really, to, to back ourselves <laughs> into that, we had to rewrite everything all the way back earlier, what, what uh, Brock and Misty were saying to her at the end of the battle. Papa? I was created to be the father who could make you happy here. If you would be happier outside, in the real... As we were saying earlier, this is what we love, the, the psychic. Oh, that's great. When we see a psychic there, it's <laughs> like nothing better than a psychic Pokemon. I guess I was curious why they wouldn't just fly right out yeah. and just fly out of there. And so they go back into the castle, which I guess we need to have happen. Yeah, so yes. we have an ending to the movie. Yeah, otherwise there would be no movie. <laughs> also, the, the wisdom of putting a five-year-old girl on the back of a flying dragon Pokemon Well, I is... think he has seatbelts. Oh, <laughs> I didn't see the restraint. What's happening? It's the unknown. They've generated so much psychic energy that they're unable to control it any longer. The crystallization is heading straight this way. Listen to me. Get out of there or you could be trapped forever. Right. Now, 
know, the, the theme of uh, the Crystal Tower and this whole thing becoming a giant tower actually goes all the way back to the Pokemon Gold and Silver Game Boy games, which is the newest, the newer release where all these characters were introduced. And throughout that entire Game Boy game, towers are a big theme. You, you go into different towers as you're playing the game uh, and try to uh, acquire as many Pokemon as possible. So the tower theme continues from, the, actually, as everything as does everything in Pokemon, from the Game Boy games itself, the storylines are established all the way through the TV shows and the movies. And that tower theme here has continued on. Also, the big release um, after Gold and Silver is a game called Pokemon Crystal, um, playing off kind of the crystal theme from the movie. At this point, nothing can break through the psychic barrier that the unknown are putting up, and that this crystal of is. I don't think they're bad either, Michael. I think they're just. Uh, no, they're just following. They're just doing what they do. They're just uh, responding to her uh, uh, sort of unconscious. Yeah, I think she's not in touch with them anymore necessarily. At this point, they're yeah, well, running think, amok, uh, right? With over, you know. An overabundance of psychic energy. Yeah, I think that was another. Now remembering back to the original, I think that was something that w was a little bit of a light explanation. Again, there wasn't a real strong explanation of why. Um, it just started happening, is yeah. what happened in the Japanese version. Yeah. So uh, we explained that a little bit more clearly here. I mean, the, Professor Oak, I think, said. Are you okay? <laughs> the key line, yeah. It takes about three about three weeks to uh, to revoice the. Wouldn't you say about three three it actually weeks? Actually, took of, us a month. Did, did it um, uh, to to revoice the, um, the the movies? Uh, and those are those are pretty full days. Those are pretty much eight hour days. But fun days. Fun, fun, fun. Yes. The whole process for us is about four and a half, five months from when we start working on the adaptation of the movie till we finish the final mix and deliver it um, to the studio. Luckily, it's sort of the length of how, how long it takes us to do them depends on, for example, in this movie, we had a lot of the characters from the series who are very, very familiar with how to match those lip flaps and to give those performances. And we had a lead uh, Pokemon character who is a psychic Pokemon. So those cut it down to about three, three and a half weeks or a month. Uh, in other situations, it, it does take longer depending on the number of human actors and new Pokemon. voices and how much lip flap. Molly. I was happy and proud to be your father. The last thing I can do for you is to take you out of this place. But how? I was born of your dreams. If you believe in me, there is nothing I cannot do. I think the sound of Entei was a... Was, uh a sound of a bear and a lion and mixed sideways and backwards and all kinds of things. When he does his roar. Here, Molly switches between Papa and Ente, kind of understanding that it's not really her Papa, but still clinging on to that memory and that affection for this character that she's kind of sort of placed all her feelings onto. That is what you wish. So here coming up is something we spend a lot of time on that nobody really notices, so... See, Which is probably good. We decided to do this uh, commentary just so we could point this out. <laughs> coming up at the end of the uh, this moment here, right before Ante leaves Molly, uh, the last thing Ante says to Molly, actually their whole conversation they have right at the end here, is exactly the last thing that she and her father said to each other at the very, very beginning of the movie. The dialogue's exactly the same. She has the same, you know, they have the same conversation. So the last thing she, the last time she sees her father and the last time she sees Ante, the conversation's exactly the same. 
It's probably something most people won't pick up on their first viewing, but we know that a lot of kids and other people, uh, you know, watch the DVDs and the tapes over and over again. So. Um, we like to put a couple little extra things in there that have a little resonating meaning for whatever it's worth. Here it comes here. Molly. Uh, uh. I must go now, Molly. Uh, and hey, I'm going to miss you. And I will miss you. Just keep me close in your dreams. We talked earlier about the fact that we had to re-edit something in the movie, and it's coming up here in a second. In the Japanese version of the movie, uh, she's left at the end of the movie without a father and without a mother, but if you stay and watch the credits, then you see that actually her father does come back. And then there's an even bigger surprise later on in the credits. And we just we just felt it was very unsatisfying in the movie, at this point of the movie, that she's left as an orphan, uh, especially since her dad just comes back when the unknown returns. So didn't seem like a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, and we you know also in Japan it might be we might work differently. People might sit through the credits, but in the states uh, or around the world, really, I think a lot, many people the second that you hear that closing theme song, you are putting your coat on. You're not watching the screen, and we just couldn't leave it that way. So we moved up the shot you're about to see in a minute of the father coming out of the void where he was when the unknown returned to their own existence. He comes back out at the wherever wherever he was in that underground cave. Um, that's a shot that actually was from the credits of the Japanese version of the movie that we moved into the story. Coming up in a second. This would be it. So at least everyone could go home knowing that the father is alive and well. And that her life has turned around or will turn around. Remember this little scene? It's not really too important, but... Uh, we had a little debate about <laughs> yeah, it, because <laughs> you'll see in a second the kids are about to start waving furiously, and they're all speaking all at once in something we encounter many times in our adaptations where they're, all the mouths are moving. But then we... Sh I think... I, I still actually don't like what we wound up doing. Yeah. Then we cut to... I think it was Molly. You'll hear the kids all yelling. Yeah. They it's all like, stop they, at exactly the same time. Everybody shows up. And so, and I think in the original Japanese, everyone's sort of saying, hi. It's like, here we go. Everybody's yelling. Hey. Here. But we, it looks like so many flaps. So it's just like a big jumble of things. But then right here, when we cut to her, we, we decided to stop. <laughs> stop. It seemed OK at the time, but then it bugged me in the theater. <laughs> here you hear Entei's theme for the last time musically. See, now a lot of people are already getting up out of their seats. Yeah, because what happens in these movies is there are many endings. Uh, so yeah. we wanted to move some of the endings into the movie to have a little closure. And the moms and dads are trying to get three or four kids together. Be, get to the bathroom before all the other families. So Out of the parking lot or wherever they are. And once again, Team Rocket has the final word. In this case, I think it was 400 words. <laughs> All alone. Ah, <sighs> we should be happy. How could we be happy? We didn't capture one new Pokemon. I'm happy for that little girl. She was adorable yet indomitable. Just like me. And that Entei was powerful and instructive. So next time you watch the movie, uh, keep your eyes on the lips and remember how much hard work it is to make all those things match up after the fact when and rewritten. Uh, I have an idea what we go through to uh, pull this together in the English version. <laughs> we hope we hope you enjoyed the movie, the Pokemon Three and the movie uh, Spell of the Unknown. And I hope you look forward to. Pokemon 4, which I don't know if we have a title for yet. 
Celebi's Time Adventure. Oh. That's all we'll say now. And then uh, keep your eyes peeled for the middle of the credits. Uh, you'll see a big surprise coming up as far as uh, Molly's life ending very happily. Those are all our wonderful actors, and we thank them. They did a great job. I think just to kind of end this, uh, it might be fun if you want to do this. Mm -hmm. When we get to the Japanese credits, let's just name everybody. You start with the first page. Just read them through. I think it won't be too hard. It'd be fun to hear what, what the names all sound like. Why don't you go for it? <laughs> Here comes the Japanese credits. are coming up in a second. Okay, I think that might be interesting we're to... naming... Just everybody. <laughs> I'm kidding, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, he really woke me up on that. <laughs> but see, this is something that's a little different. I know we should be ending. But if you look through all these credits, I mean, there's a lot of design and animation production and thought that goes in, and the story goes right to the end. So, um, yeah, I mean, even, you know, I think one thing about the world of Pokemon, is there's always extra value added on virtually everything we do. So there goes even the movie, the credits have more story. Right up to the last second you're in the theater, the last second you're watching this, there'll be extra story going on, wrapping up the story in the credits. And why it's also important is because we've got to get the characters back into where they need to be for the TV series. It's not like we can just end the story anywhere. There's, these stories on the movies figure into their lives on the TV show. So I think that's one of the other reasons why the credits uh, kind of wrap everything up. Charizard's got to go back home uh, to the Charizific uh, Valley. Or Charorific, I can't say the word. Um, everybody's got to get back to what they were doing because we've got other entertainment mediums, media to uh, deal with here. And just, you know, there are hundreds of people work on these things. So for... Uh, you know, so many people working for such a long time, doing all the details and and things that, on the first or second or even fifth viewing, you don't really notice. But uh, they just do a sensational job, and we're always grateful for the great work that they do. It makes our job a lot easier. Mr. Mime really made not a big appearance in the movie. <laughs> Mr. Mime is one of our favorite Pokemon. Do you do Mr. Mime? The, no, no. In fact, we saw Mr. Mime. I thought, oh, good. Cool. Here's a Pokemon that doesn't speak, but the mimes in Japan speak, I guess. So here's uh, here's uh, the scene here's we were talking surprise, about. Yeah. That if you didn't have the setup that we gave it in our version of the script, where the mom disappeared while searching for the unknown might not make any sense. To us, the logic of this is that, well, well since the dad returned from the unknown void, it's safe to assume that whatever happened to the mother has now been resolved as well. So for Molly, if you're still in the theater, if you were still in the theater, uh, you were very happy for Molly at this moment. And Michael and I, when we first watched, was like, well, did he find a bride exactly like the original mother? <laughs> yeah, because we thought we really the had no was... idea what was going on here. <laughs> Who is this woman? Uh, and then we called and we spoke with our Japanese partners, and they told us that they had this original story where the mother was institutionalized because the father was working too much, and we, we decided we had to do something little... else. So anyway, that's it for us, I guess. Michael, always a pleasure. I'll see always you on a movie pleasure, four. Norman, and thanks to all the Pokemon fans. Keep watching. Gotta catch them all. Thank you. <laughs>